Some would say Philemon, some would say Philemon, some would say Philemon. That's just what we're going to go with this morning because that's probably the closest pronunciation that we could get to this book. Philemon, okay? Philemon. Put that together real quick. You make sure I pronounce it right for the rest of the time, all right? Philemon, all right? Let's get into this book. I apologize to God earlier in the week, and here's what I said. God, you have blessed me to be a minister now for 22 years. I'm probably approaching somewhere around 1,500 times that I've stood and give a sermon that God has given me to be able to give to Christians everywhere that he has sent me to give. And probably at no time over these years have I said, turn to the book of Philemon. And I have yet to mention this guy's name that I'm going to mention here in just a little bit. And you can see it down in verse 10, Onesimus. Now, if I were to ask you, what does Onesimus mean to you? <laughs> You're going to say, I don't even know what that word means. Well, that's somebody's name. And it's a great biblical character that we have probably all looked over, maybe not even give the attention to even read his name in Philemon. Philemon is only, by the way, 25 verses. It is the shortest letter that Paul wrote in all of his ministry. I even put you some facts about this book there. Paul wrote this while he was under house arrest. He couldn't leave his home. People could still come and see him, and that's an important part for us to understand how Onesimus ever got in contact with Paul. Paul could still have visitors. They could still come and go, but he was under house arrest. He was very restricted in the movements that he could have. So what happened in the book of Philemon is that Paul is going to have to write a letter of recommendation. And in 25 verses, he is going to be giving to us in this letter of recommendation things that we ought to have in our life. Things like this, a past. Things like salvation. Things like reconciliation, forgiveness, and the ability to be able to know and understand that we've all got a past, but we've all got the ability to be saved. And because we've all got the ability to be saved after our conversion, that we reconcile the differences that we have had in the past. And so that's why I titled this sermon A Small Powerful Punch because that's exactly what Philemon is. In 25 verses, it is a small powerful punch to us, a spiritual punch that lets us know that this book just didn't get put in the Bible by accident. And so this 25 verses, the shortest letter that Paul had ever written to anybody. Romans, by the way, was the longest letter, but Philemon is the shortest. There is no chapters. It's only one chapter. And so I want you to go home sometime today before you go to bed tonight, and I want you to read all 25 verses of Philemon, and then when you get to work in the morning and someone says, what did you do over the weekend? You can say, I read a book. And that's what you've done. You've read a book. That would be Parker's best thing. He would be the one that I would say, boys, go get a, find a book to read. And he would go to Philemon, 25 verses. He would go to 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, okay? And if you're not familiar with any of those, that's some of the shortest books of all the 66 books of the Bible. But let's just get started here, and I'm just going to read verse 1 as the introduction. When Paul basically starts his letter, this is his dear so-and-so. Just like we would write a letter today, here is the salutation when Paul says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy our brother, unto Philemon our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And he goes on to say, and he calls out what is believed to be maybe Philemon's wife and child. And he goes on to say in verse 2 that you have the church in your house. 
So we know now that Philemon is a leader of a church in the area where he's at. He is a great man of God. And for the next several verses, all the way down in the first seven verses of the 25, Paul is bragging on Philemon for being an outstanding man of God. Now let me stop there before we go any further in this letter. I hope that's exactly what your neighbors and your friends and your acquaintances and society can say about you is that you are a great child of God, that they know you as a Christian. They know you as someone who is a person of faith. Not just that you are a good person. I know a lot of good people that are not saved. I know a lot of people that if we was going on deserving, that they might be able to say they deserve to be blessed. They deserved to be happy because they, they are good people. They do right by their neighbors. They don't cause ruckus in society. They've never been arrested. The law never has to come to their house. You would leave your kids with them. You would allow them to watch your house while you're gone. They're just good, decent people. I know tons of those in the world that we live today, good people, but they're not saved people. They're not people of faith. They're not ready for heaven, and what a tragedy that it is. And yes, I came here yesterday. I'll give you a little insight about how I prep for Sunday service. I love spending time in God's house by myself here on Saturday. Saturdays are my day to get ready for you on Sunday. Sunday is a work day for me in a sense, but Saturday is my day that I love spending time around God's house. And here's how I was going to start it. I put my, I put my uh, industrious-sized leaf blower... That makes me feel like such a man. It's not one of these ones, no battery-powered deals. It's not one that you pack around. No, I strap up, my friend, with a backpack. I mean, I could blow my truck off the driveway if I wanted to. So I, I, I put that thing up. It's getting the time of year here at Willow Fern. We call it Willow Fern because there are trees everywhere, willows, ferns, and there's leaves all over the parking lot, and I hate that on Sunday morning. So I come up here Saturday after we went to a football game, after we traveled to Pike County, we come back. I said, I'm going to church for the rest of the night. Cassie said, don't forget, we're supposed to go to Bruce's drive. I said, I ain't worried about Bruce. Don't worry about that. I'm going to church for a while and I'm getting ready. And, and I got up here and I started, I, I spent probably 15, 20 minutes blowing every single leaf off the church property. Immediately upon shutting off that leaf blower, God said, too bad. Woof. Like gale force winds, thunderstorm, rain, lightning, every leaf in Beulah blew on the church parking lot. And I said, well, God, if that's the way you're going to be, I'll just go inside and prepare the sermon. And he said, well, let's go to Philemon. Well, and so after I got ready and done all of that, I went back out and blew some of the leaves back off so I could show God I meant business with the leaf blower. But before I'd done all that, I sat up here on the altar last night and I prayed for some of you that had been coming to church for a long time and you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Oh, you're as old as the furniture. Some of you have been here longer, much longer than I have. And I have said that. I said that even in my prayers. I said, God, some of these people have been coming two and three and four times longer than I've been coming to this church. And they've still not been moved. Their heart's not been changed. They're not ready for heaven. Oh, they're good people, but they're not saved people. And I want you to understand that when Philemon was being written this letter by the Apostle Paul, Paul said, you're a great man of God. In verse 3, he said, grace to you and peace, faith or from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. He goes on to talk about his love 
And Paul said, I am so refreshed to hear that you are such an outstanding man of God and you're doing good things in the church. We're in this together. Our church is not separated from the other churches today that are waving the bloodstained banner of Christ. We're all singing when we all get to heaven. We're all singing victory in Jesus. Some may sing it a little different. We may sing it on a different pitch. We may sing it at a little bit slower pace or a little bit faster pace, but my friend, we're not on this march to heaven by ourselves. There are thousands upon thousands of churches today where Christians are gathered alike and we're worshiping the name of Jesus. Jesus, knowing that today could be the day that Christ comes back to gather his church. Just like the thunder clap yesterday, there could be a sound like we've never heard that comes today in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's how quick it's going to be that I'm going to leave this world for the world to come where we will be there for 10,000 years and have no less days to sing God's praise. And every day that I live on this earth makes me that much more energetic about going to heaven. And I hope you can say the same. What was the purpose of this letter? All right, he's going he's to get out his pen. And Paul is going to write 25 verses. And it's a letter of recommendation for a runaway slave. Onesimus was a runaway slave of Philemon. He was a servant of this man of God. And we don't really know what happened. Maybe he stole some money and in fear of getting caught, he was going to run away. Maybe he had taken something that wasn't his. We see a little bit about that in verse 18 where Paul said, if he hath wronged thee and oweth thee anything, put it on my account, I'll pay his debt. And so this runaway slave had traveled a thousand miles away from Philemon who owned him as a servant. And when he got to the presence of Paul, he somehow, maybe we could just say God put him in the presence of Paul, a man of God that could show him the way. And maybe you have come to Willow Fern this morning and you have no idea why you're here, but for some reason you just had an urgency to be in God's house this morning. And now all of a sudden, God is speaking to you. Onesimus was on the run, but God had a plan for him. Jonah was on the run. God had a plan for him. Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul, was on the run, but God had a plan for him. And so there are many times in the Word of God where we see that people are on the run, but God stopped them in their tracks because he had a plan for them. At what point are you going to rise up and listen to God because he's knocking on your heart saying, I've got a plan for you. And a thousand miles later, we find where that Onesimus finds himself in the presence of Paul, who is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he gets saved. The slave gets saved. The thief gets saved. Doesn't that ring a bell that the thief on the cross who didn't deserve salvation, who could not earn salvation, who couldn't get off the cross and go do any good after that he was saved, but yet Christ still said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today you're going to make your way into a place called heaven. All because he asked Jesus Will you remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? And by faith he accepted Christ as his personal Savior. And so I want you to know this morning, my friend, that no matter what, that Christ is offering a letter for you. Just like in verse 10 when Paul said these letters or these words, he said, I beg of thee. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, who I have begotten in my bonds, who has come to know Christ in my presence and is now a Christian, this man that is on the run from you, maybe he stole from you, maybe he did you wrong. I understand all that, but Paul said, I'm writing you a letter on his behalf that when I, he comes back to you, I want you to receive him well. 
Now, this is a hard letter for the Apostle Paul to have to write because he's writing it to a fellow Christian. Maybe I shouldn't say it's difficult for him to write, but it's a hard place to be because he knows that Philemon has been wronged by this man. But now this man has been saved. And he's going to make his way back. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about your transgressions. And I want you to look in verse 11 of Philemon when it says this, which in time past, speaking of this servant, was unprofitable. In his past, he's done something wrong. And you say, oh, well, they should put him to death. Okay? So you must be like one of the ones who had the stone ready to cast on the lady with, who had taken in the act of adultery, but Jesus said, he that don't have a past, well, I let him throw the first stone. Well, I say kill her. Jesus said, go ahead and put her to death, but he that is without sin, let them cast the first stone. And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Don't continue on. Not that it's okay with what you've done, but stop and change your life and go and be blessed. And so I have put in the top page, top of the page on your outline on the second half. You say, yes, we finally got into the second part. This is a little bit of an application for you, a practical application at some time. You don't have to do it now, but I want you to do it sometime very soon so that it dares not leave your mind and the devil can't swoop in and make you forgetful. But I want you to fill in the blank where it says, in time past, because what I want you to be reminded of is where you came from, because you can't be near as thankful for where you are today if you forget where you came from. See, the problem that a lot of Christians have is that when we sit in the pews for so long, we somehow tend to forget where Christ brought us from. And then when somebody comes in and we know their past, we look at their past and say, oh, no, this place is not for you. Oh, no. The Jesus that I know, he's not for you. You can't do what you do and be saved. So I want you to fill in the blank where it said, in time past, I was. And you don't have the pages and you don't have, I only put two lines. Well, my friend, I could take those. You say, well, Jody, what are you going to put in there? Well, first of all, I'm going to need a lot more than two lines. And you say, well, tell us some of them. My friend, I'll tell you what my past was, just the same as yours. We were all sinners. We were no different. You say, well, I believe that you was worse than me or I was worse than you. No, the Bible says we're none righteous. No, not one. Not one of us can live up to the righteousness of God, meet the expectations of God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible says if you've broken the law in one part, you've broken it all. So don't come in here with your too good attitude that says, oh, no, I, I'm not near as bad as some people were. I want you to write down what your past was because we know what the, the servant's past was because Paul told us that there was a time in his past where he was unprofitable. He had done something wrong. And Paul admonished that. He said, I know he's got a past. Well, let's just clear the record. We all do. We've all got something in the closet that we would love to keep in the closet. The one thing I know about getting older, the more I, the older I get and the more I talk to people and different people is that we've all got something we would love to be able to go back and change and erase and never happen. But we can't let our past be a death sentence to where we are now. We can't let a bad marriage before be a death sentence to the marriage that we're in now. You can't let a bad relationship 40 years ago be a detriment to all the relationships that you're in today. You can't let a bad situation at the workplace that happened 10 years ago keep you from being a great employee today. The past is always going to be a reminder, yes, but it should be a reminder that Christ has forgiven us and set us free. 
And we're no longer entangled by that bondage of our past. And so Paul said, yes, this guy has a past. Yes, he has a past. And in his letter, he moves on to say this, but he got saved. Whom I have begotten in my bonds. Onesimus was a servant on the run who was converted by Paul. And Paul was going to have to say something now to Philemon that was going to be touchy. He said, when Onesimus comes back with this letter, this 25 verses that I have written, when he comes back with letter in hand and you're reading this, I want you to know that I want you to take him in as a son and not a servant. That reminds me of Luke chapter 15. For there was a young boy who'd messed up everything his dad had ever taught him. And he had spoiled all the good things that his dad had saved up for him. And the prodigal son didn't know anything else to do but go back home to dad. And when he was going back home to dad, he was fearful that his dad wouldn't accept him. He was fearful that his dad would cast him out. And he said, I know, he thought in his mind, when I get to dad, this is what I'll say. And when he finally seen his dad, he said, Dad, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me a servant. And now we're finding where that Onesimus is coming with a letter that says, please don't treat me like a servant, but treat me like a son. And he had left on the run. He had stolen maybe from whatever the situation was. We know it wasn't good. And he abused the relationship with his owner. And so we find where that the master wasn't pleased, but he was going to go back and say, I don't want to be a servant anymore. I want to be your son. Salvation, salvation, salvation. Christ doesn't want you to be a servant. Christ wants you to be his son. Christ doesn't want you to be his slave. Christ wants you to be his daughter. He wants you to be brought into the kingdom of God, not as a servant, but as a child. You know, I, we went to that little party last night, and, and, and it wasn't a little party there. It was a feast. And I, I did eat a lot. And again, not near as much as some. And I can name names. Brad. Bruce, Norm, all those guys ate more than me. And you know that. You know that to be the truth. But we went there, you know what? And, and, and we lit the candles, and there's 18 candles on Derek's cake, and Derek's turning 18, and D Derek is the apple of the family's eye, and, and, and he's just, he's, he, they get, he is giving them a lot to be proud of. He's a good kid. And you could just tell the family, yes, they're proud. 18 years old, they've, they've done something good. They've raised a good kid. And in today's society, that's unique. They've raised a good kid, and they were happy for him. And do you know why? And, and, and Burris, as soon as I got there, I, I, I left here. Bruce had run my phone off the hook. And finally, I said, I, if I get done at church in time, I'll make time for you. And I did. And so I stopped by there, and I ate. And Bernice came in and said, if you hadn't have showed up here, I wasn't coming to church in the morning. <laughs> and that's how proud they are. That's their child. That's their grandchild. They treat him as a son. Derek is not a slave. Derek is not a servant. Derek is their child. And they love him and they're proud of him. And that's exactly, my friend, the, the situation where we find Paul said, I want you to take this runaway servant. I want that done you wrong. I don't want you to take him in as a servant. I want you to take him in as a child. And so then we see, my friend, in verse 15, if you'll look in Philemon, verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but as a, but as a son, a brother beloved, above a servant, 
And so now Paul has put on the words. He said, I don't want you to take him in as a servant. I, I want you to take him in as a son. You know what Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says? Let me read it to you. It's not on the screen. I told Sarah, we only want to put up Philemon words this morning. But Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says this, Be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now this hurts, right? This is the punch. Here's the punch in the spiritual gut is that we've all had somebody that has wronged us. We've all had somebody that has spoke evil against us. We've all had somebody that has betrayed us. We all have somebody that has slapped us in the face. We've all had somebody that has turned their back on us. How are we going to treat them? Are we going to smack them back? Are we going to turn our back to their back and never be reunited again? Well, the Bible says this, that we ought to be tenderhearted, Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sakes has forgiven you. And when that prodigal son walked down to his dad and said, Dad, I don't want to be called, I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. I'll, I'll just be a servant. We all know the story in Luke 15, how that the prodigal son's dad, do you know what he done? He hugged him, he kissed him, and he said, go get the best we had. Bring the ring and put it on his finger. Kill the calf. We're going to have a big steak. We're going to have ribeye. We're going to have tin roll. We're going to have it all. We're going to have hamburger. We're going to have it all. Why? Because this, my son, was lost, but now he is found. He's never going to be a servant. He's never going to be a slave. That's my son. And he has come back home, and we're going to be thankful for it. Here's the part of the reconciliation. If you go back up there and you think about your time past and what you've done against God, God has every right to cast you off. He has no need to accept you. God has every right to be able to kick you out, not give you an invitation to heaven. If you think about the times you cursed him, spit upon him, turned your back on him, forsaken him, been lazy to him, not believed in him, why you he owes you nothing. He owes you absolutely nothing. God don't owe you nothing. Have you ever been able to come to God and say, God, I've done good today. What are you going to give me? <laughs> are you crazy? Your righteousness is nothing but filthy rags in the sight of a perfect deity. But God is saying to you, if you'll come to him, he will in no wise cast you out. There is no rejection with Christ, my friend. For those that would come to him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, the Bible says he cannot and will not cast you out. There is a reconciliation all because of the love of Christ. We end with this this morning. I want you to look at verse 8 and verse 9. Let me, let me explain to you the situation that Paul was in. Paul was the apostle of God. He had the authority over Philemon. And he said this. He said, wherefore... Though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. In other words, I could demand by authority that you accept this man. I am the apostle. I am the leader. I have the authority in Christ to demand that you accept this man who has wrongfully done what he done against you. Paul said, "I'm listen, don't make me use the authority that I have. But he said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to use the authority. I, I'm not saying you must. I'm not saying you have to. But in verse 9, he said, For love's sake, I rather beseech you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son, there was at least three people that Paul referred to as his son. Timothy, Titus, and Onesimus. And before this morning, you might have heard of Timothy. You might have heard of Titus. But you had no idea who Onesimus was. But if you'll read the Bible, my friend, people ask me all the time, where should I start? I think from here on out, I'm going to send them to Philemon. When these new Christians say, Jody, where should I start reading the Bible? I'm going to say Philemon. 
And they're going to say, where's that at? Find it. It's a single page. On my, in my Bible, it's a single page. And all, that's all it is, 25 verses on a single page. And I'm going to tell them, go to Philemon and read one of the great love stories. There you'll find in 25 verses, you'll find a man that had a past and done wrong, and you'll find his salvation, you'll find his reconciliation, you'll find a church family that wants good for others in the church family, you'll find, you'll find camaraderie, you'll find it all in 25 verses of Philemon. Amen? And so I want you to go home tonight, and I want you to read all 25 verses. And when somebody asks you in the morning what you've done over the weekend, you're going to say, I read the best little book. And you say, oh, really? Well, I've been, I, I just got done reading the book. What, what did you read? You say, Philemon. And they're going to look at you like you've got three eyeballs. And you're going to have to say, well, let me tell you about Philemon. He was a man of God, a leader of the church. He had a slave that run off because he'd done him wrong. And Paul, the apostle, wrote Philemon a letter, a letter of recommendation saying, will you take him back? And don't take him back as a slave. Take him back as a son because he now is one of us because God has saved him and cleaned him up. Boy, that's a message the whole world needs to hear. A message of forgiveness, a message of long-suffering, a message of patience, a message of reconciliation, a message of a big hug that brings people back in, not as servants, not as slaves, but as children of God. That's what God wants to do for you this morning. He wants you to bring you into the fold of God. He knows your past. You don't have to write it down on this outline. You, you don't have to fill up the two lines. You don't have to fill up the full, full page. God knows your past, and he still loves you. God knows your past, and he's still got to work for you. God knows your past, and he's still got a talent to give you. Most importantly, God knows your past, and he wants to wash it away with the innocent blood of his son Jesus that was shed on the cross for you. Stand with us this morning. All